Okay then, let's start. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Martha Vlaku, uh, and together with uh, uh, Carl Samuelson and uh, Gino Almondo, we are organizing this machine learning in music uh, Stockholm AI Summit. Hi. So, uh, before we start, we ask you to answer a couple of questions. So, let's look at what you said here, and we can also understand who is our audience. Uh, so, okay, give me one second to switch between screens here. Good. I see a lot of students here, uh, but then also professionals, uh, technical, a lot of technical people, but also uh, business people here. So that's great that we have a diverse audience. Oops. And there should be one more person here. Yes, and how did you find out about the event uh, from Stockholm AI website? I'm glad that uh, you are following that. And I'm glad that word of mouth is also working. So uh, you talk to friends and colleagues. So very nice. Uh, so let's get back to our event then. And again, I need to switch between slides here. Um, Great, but then uh, let's start. So what we're going to hear about today, um, first of all, an introduction about Stockholm AI and a few words from our Diamond partners. Uh, and then we will uh, welcome uh, first Daniel Del Castillo from uh, Soundtrack Your Brand, who's going to talk about identifying language in music from audio. Uh, then we're going to have a couple of minutes for questions. So please use uh, join Slido uh, with the hashtag Stockholm AI to write your questions throughout the presentation, the moment that uh, you think about them, uh, so that's good. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, we will welcome Gustavo Pereira from Spotify, who is going to talk about his work on advanced clustering techniques for audience segmentation. Um, just for your information, this event is recorded. Uh, and uh, we will be very glad to share after it is uh, reviewed with all of you um, in our channels. Uh, so first of all, who we are, uh, Stockholm AI. So uh, Stockholm AI is a community that was founded in 2017. And uh, ideally it serves as a platform for knowledge exchange between also business and also students, researchers, academia, uh, and so on. Uh, today, this community has reached over 3,000 uh, members uh, from AI professionals, researchers, students, uh, everyone who loves machine learning and AI. And uh, the idea of Stockholm AI is actually to put uh, Stockholm uh, in the machine learning and AI global map. Uh, we, we want Stockholm to be recognized um, as a global player within that field. So if you want to be part of the story, uh, just join us at stockholm.ai. You will find uh, lots of info there. Um, so at this point, let's thank our partners who really support uh, this community and this effort. And we can start by uh, hearing from uh, BCG Gamma and Michael Forge uh, a couple of words. So Michael, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. So um, uh, we are BCG Gamma, which is a part of BCG, which is a global strategic uh, consultancy firm. So we are kind of the, the AI, the machine learning branch of that. Um, and we have offices in, I think it's roughly 90 countries, so it's a very global player. Um, and I mean, we do a, a lot of, of uh, different type of, of cases in all types of industries also, of course, with uh, both private and, and 
of course, uh, kind of institutions around the globe. And uh, we are always, of course, on the lookout for talented people. So if you are a data scientist, machine learning engineer, or anything of that nature, very welcome to apply. We also accept uh, people on, on internships as well. Um, yeah, I think that's the, a small introduction on, on our end. Happy, of course, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so then let's also hear from uh, um, Ericsson and uh, Tobias Ley. Hi, Tobias. Yes. Hi, Manta. Do you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Good. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this session. Um, I would like to uh, shortly share a bit of what we do in Ericsson. I hope you can see my screen now, Mata. Yes. Okay, excellent. So we have built up an organization of 300 data scientists and data engineers in Ericsson. We are based here in Stockholm, but also in Silicon Valley in the US in Santa Clara. And we have as well a site in Montreal, Canada, close to the universities there, and as well as in India. And we're looking into using AI to uh, enhance uh, the automation of our networks, the telecom networks, especially the 5G networks, but also increase performance and the efficiency of it. So we have built a couple of different solutions uh, during um, this year, like for example, AI-powered network services or traffic event management, or for example, an augmented mind or sleep solution, which um, switches off the antennas of 5G systems to save energy during low load. So this uh, proved to be a quite a powerful tool to reduce the energy um, usage of the telecom networks by 14% in Vodafone network actually. So we see AI as a big opportunity to improve the network and to bring benefit to the operators in the society. So if you're interested to join us, we are still hiring uh, here as well in Stockholm, but also in um, different sites across our development units of globe. And you will find that information on the ericsson.com slash EN careers. And uh, then you can scroll down and actually um, search for jobs. So we have a couple of job openings there. For example, senior software engineers in AI and AI, uh, but also senior data scientists and machine learning in the research and development organization, master thesis. Uh, we are also taking in summer students. If you're more into data engineering, that's a possibility as well. Solution architect and as well um, technology specialists in the AI area as such needed. So please feel free to go onto our ericsson.com website and apply here. Thanks a lot, Marta. Over to you. Thank you, Tobias. Um, so then, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, so then uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Daniel uh, to the stage. Um, and Daniel has prepared a video for us. Uh, but first of all, you can say a few words about yourself, Daniel, and then we can go ahead and, and share the video. Yes, hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. And thank you, Marta and Sakomai for inviting me. So I've been uh, working for around a year more on this problem on identifying language in music um, for soundtrack your brand. And also I finished my master's uh, also around one year, a bit more in KTH, in machine learning. And I've been particularly interested in, uh, in language and in music and also a combination of both. So I hope you can find it useful, the presentation I prepared. And hope you enjoy it. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, I'll open the presentation just now. All right, so let's start. This is the agenda we're going to cover today. 
I'm going to start with an introduction to the problem of identifying language in music. Then I'm going to say why it's important. And I'm going to also give an overview of the problem. Secondly, I'm going to talk about different approaches to this problem and also some previous related work on this field. And finally, I'm going to describe some promising directions and uh, maybe give a bit of hope for people that are interested in, solver, in solving this problem. So let's start with the intro. The technical name for the problem of identifying language in music is singing language identification, or a SLID. So a SLID system simply takes as input a music recording and produces as output the identity of the language sung in that music recording. It basically strikes the language content in a song, and it tells us the language it corresponds to. And why is this important? Because music, music streaming businesses have huge catalogs of content that they need to filter in order to be able to recommend it to their customers. And uh, these recommendations are usually based on their customers' preferences. This preference can be, for example, the, the level of energy of a song, or if the song is instrumental or not, which are relatively easy categories to obtain from a music recording. However, language, which is also very relevant, especially for music business-to-business uh, -business recommendations, because of the major role that localization plays here, is a bit trickier to obtain. And one of the main reasons why language is a bit trickier to obtain is because of the differences between speech and singing recordings. So in speech recordings, for example, phoneme duration is quite consistent, whereas in singing, vowels are stretched. Also, pitch, loudness, and rhythm distributions have huge variances in singing, whereas in speech are, again, quite consistent. And finally, when it comes to interference, we see many times how speech recordings have interference in the form of noise, but in singing, the actual other instruments that are present in the music recording count as interference. They count as distortion. So, as a high-level problem overview, we somehow need to, from a raw input, such as a one-dimensional waveform, which is the usual way in which we represent a song, for example, in our computers, we need to extract the correct language. How do we do this? So, there's different ways, there's different approaches to this problem, and one of them is called end-to-end. End-to-end systems resemble the famous black box, they're a single system that somehow processes the raw input and they produce the predicted language. And they do this thanks to two main components. One of them is the encoder, or front-end, which maps input vectors into a latent space. And the second one is the decoder, or back-end, which generates the predictions from the map representations in this latent space. So as you can see here, our raw inputs can be either waveforms or waveforms transformed into 2D spectrograms that we feed into the encoder. This will map our inputs into the latent space representations in the form of vectors, which will then be processed by the decoder to generate the predicted language labels. So end-to-end -end systems have been recently relevant, especially in 2014, where the paper End-to-end -end Learning for Music Audio was published. This paper was the first to discover that the networks, particularly deep convolution networks, like the one we can see here, were able to autonomous, autonomously discover frequency decompositions from raw audio, which is the same thing that classical algorithms that uh, transform our representations from time domain to frequency domain do. The difference is that these networks were able to do it automatically without us telling them to do it with a program. Also, there was another paper from one year ago which managed to obtain uh, performance on par with the state of the art by using an end-to-end -end system to predict the top 50 tags of songs in a, in a big data set. So, end-to-end -end systems have also been very successful in music auto-tagging. Here we can see 
how the, the raw audio waveforms are fed into the front end, then into the back end, and finally the tags are predicted. The second approach, the alternative approach to end to end systems, are called piecewise systems, which are definitely more crafty. They require a bit of domain knowledge. And we'll go step by step to describe these kind of systems. So let's imagine, as an analogy, if we have this song represented as a 3D spectrogram, because we have on the horizontal axis the time, on the vertical axis we have frequency values, and the color as a third dimension represents the intensity of the signal at each instant of time and at each value of frequency. So let's say we want to somehow predict the type of drums that are present in this song. The first thing we would do would probably be to isolate the drum signal, right? Here we go. Now we have isolated the drums and of course we need to get rid of all the other irrelevant information that is present in the signal. So by simply cutting it out or segmenting it, we are left out only with the segments that contain the drums information. So probably once we have that we just want to fit it into our model that after training with many and many other signals we'll be able to generate the correct predictions for our drums. So identifying language in music follows a very similar process. First we want to isolate the vocals by a process called source separation and this component is based on two assumptions. The first one is that vocal signals alone will be more useful as a source of input features than the complete music recording. This assumption is actually a bit controversial and it's hard to evaluate. The second assumption is that available source separation algorithms are sufficiently effective to obtain a clear vocal signal from each music recording. And about this assumption we can say a bit more. Because in the past two years, the SDR, the signal to distortion ratio, has been doubled thanks to the development of machine learning and concrete, concretely deep learning methods. These are some of the systems that have advanced the state of the art in the past years, and they all have some common features. Here we can see some of the common features. For example, encoder and decoder architecture seems to be a common choice. Also, dilated convolutions has, have been successful in the past. And finally, CNN are clearly dominating the field. The second step in our pre-processing pipeline of piecewise system is segmentation which consists in finding the language, finding those segments in our song that will most likely give us the relevant information for characterizing the language. So when the field started in 2004, segmentation was done manually, but of course it was too costly. Two years later, Zweniger performed a segmentation based on energy thresholding. But the results were a bit rough. And after that, several papers published have actually questioned if segmentation improves the results at all in singing language identification. So after we have performed or not segmentation, it's time to extract the features that will characterize the language. These are some examples of the features we can have. We can choose to not perform any frequency decomposition or any time to frequency transformation at all, and we just can feed our waveforms into our models. And if we choose to transform our representations into the frequency domain, we also have, we also have several options. For example, MFCCs have been successful in the past in speech applications, but they have a caveat, which is that they are susceptible to noise. 
Alternatively, STFTs are uh, less susceptible to noise. They belong to the linear scale. They are invertible, which is also an advantage, but they're not biomimetic. They don't mimetize uh, our human ears. Log, log male spectrograms, however, are non-invertible. Non they are in the logarithmic scale, and they are also biomimetic. As an alternative representation or feature, we can have also embeddings that can be transferred, for, transferred from other audio-related applications. And finally, once we have our features, we can feed them into our model. But first, let's talk about why this problem of identifying language in music is still unsolved. So first of all, there is a strong reliance in pre-processing. Because most of the information that is present in our music recordings is irrelevant for identifying language in music. Secondly, the same way our own ears require a lot of input to be able to figure out the language in many songs, especially in genres such as metal, these models require a large input size, which makes, it, uh, makes the problem also computationally expensive. And finally, as we saw before, with pitch, loudness, and rhythm, and other characteristics, these features that are some, sometimes important to be able to determine the language have uh, input variance, sorry, have the variance that is huge in their distributions. Also, it's important to mention that the research is still very young. In the field, there's only around 10 published papers that have attempted to solve the problem. There's a big lack of references and standards as well, because every different paper evaluates their method in their particular way and on a particular subset of languages, so it's very hard to compare different methods and different performances. And finally, there is also a big lack of labeled data, but I guess this is common on, on other fields as well in machine learning. So if we look at the research for, so far, we can look at the, the first paper that started the field in 2004, which obtained 70% classification accuracy on English and Mandarin for 20, 224 popular music songs. Then two years later, they achieved 64%, this time for English and German, on a slightly bigger dataset, and this time with two different genres of a cappella music recordings. Eight years later, they slightly improved their currency, but this time for three languages and a smaller dataset of a cappella singing recordings. And finally, the state of the art is held now by YouTube, which uh, obtained 47.8% for 25 languages on 25k music videos. So they trained on audio and visual features this time. But if we look at these results a bit more closely, we can see that they actually obtain less than 30% for English, English, French and German that are widely represented in global music, whereas they obtain more than 60% on other less represented languages. And if we look at the data from global music market from a couple of years ago, we can see how English, German, and French dominate the market. So now we have a better idea of, of, the, of the achievings of this, of this paper. So let's talk about some promising directions of this field. We're going to focus on the preprocessing area of the pipeline. So let's start with the source separation component. Last year there was a, pub a publication by, uh, by, De by Deezer. They published a library called Splitter that performs source separation with high accuracy. They obtained the second best result for signal to distortion ratio for vocals on the standard data set of MuseDB18. It is also quite easy to use, it's kind of a plug-and-play library. It is GPU-compatible, 
And they also claim that it's 100 times faster than real time, which I guess it means that the time it takes to process uh, the song is 100 times faster than its own duration. What about segmentation? It's important to mention that there is still not a consistent method across languages that performs segmentation. As we saw before, the variance in the different characteristics and distributions is very high across languages and music styles. So it is really hard to locate those segments of the songs where the language content is most present. So how do we make it easy? We can make an assumption saying that language can be characterized more effectively by verses. Because we can assume that choruses are more expressive and therefore the language content is more hidden. If we look at the typical song structure of popular music, we can see that we only have two components, the verse and the chorus. And we can see how throughout the song these two components repeat. So how do we try to exploit these repetitive patterns? One possible solution is autocorrelation. Autocorrelation is a function that computes the correlation from a signal to a shifted version of itself. Also, it's important to mention that autocorrelation can be computed using the fast Fourier transform, so it's quite computationally efficient. And it can potentially exploit recurring patterns in songs, song structures, especially in pop, also reducing the input size. Here we have a chromogram rep representation of a song. The chromogram is a diagram that shows on the, vert on the horizontal axis time and on the vertical axis the pitch class. So in the end, it's a representation of the harmonic structure of the song. By computing autocorrelation of a chromogram of a song, we obtain these vertical bars, which are showing the, the places of the song in time where the harmonic structure repeats itself. So, when there is more density of these vertical bars, there should be more repetitive patterns. And we can try to imagine how these higher density areas correspond to the most repetitive patterns, at least in popular music, which are the curses and the verses, as we saw before. Moreover, we can actually perform vocal isolation before we compute the chromogram and the autocorrelation of the chromogram, and we can confirm our hypothesis that this higher density of vertical bars correspond to the choruses, as we can see here. And now, after performing vocal isolation, we can see how this song resembles a typical structure of a popular music song, in which we start with an intro, then we pass on to the first verse, the first chorus, a repetition of the verse, a repetition of the chorus, then a bridge, and finally the last chorus, finishing with the outro. And what about feature extraction? Well, there are two ways to perform feature extraction, or there are two ways in which we can feed the features to our classifier model. One of them is by simply feeding the raw, the raw representations that we obtain at the input, either in wavefor form or in spectrogram form, and let the classifier, the model, which can be a neural network, for example, do the heavy lifting. It's worth mentioning that the Temporal Convolution Network has obtained really good results for these kind of applications in recent years. 
this network is a simple and generic CNN that collects two of the most uh, important tricks in deep learning in the past years, which are dilated convolutions and residual blocks. Dilated convolutions effectively increase the receptive field size without loss of resolution by interleaving kernel elements without the need of using padding or stride parameters. And residual blocks have proven in image applications to stabilize large networks with up to thousands of layers. Also, there have been several successful papers that use TCNs. One of them is the use of non casual CNN layers with TCN blocks for speech and music detection. And another one is an autoencoder with the TCN network module that works as a mass generator for source separation. This, one, this last one has obtained uh, comparable to state-of-the-art results for source separation. Alternatively, to, feed, uh, to feeding raw inputs to the classifier and let it do the heavy lifting, we can also take advantage of transfer learning by extracting embeddings from another pre-trained network and feeding them to our classifier we can obtain better results even. One example of this is a paper published recently called Musician or Music CNN that has obtained really good results in auto tagging by pre training their networks on big datasets. So you can find the embeddings of these pre trained networks and use it use them to your own applications. And that's it. I hope you found it useful and please let me know about your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, about this very good presentation. Uh, it made a lot of people curious here, so we have a couple of questions that uh, need answering. So let me share the, the question tab and we can take it together. Um, so first, uh, is there a genre that is easier or harder for the AI to recognize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, if you perform source separation, you will notice that um, usually find that the genres are more, that are easier to recognize the language in are the ones that are, are closer to speech recordings actually, which makes a lot of sense. So if you try to identify language in, let's say, for example, heavy metal with heavy instrumental uh, signals and also kind of undecipherable uh, language, uh, yeah, you will have a bad time probably. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Um, uh, another question, uh, less common languages are better recognized. Uh, I assume the data is not abundant uh, for Pashto as compared to that for English. Do you know why it is like that? Uh, I, I don't really know. I know that um, some research groups are working on this. I think uh, the music technology group in Barcelona is actively working on getting bigger datasets for less represented languages. Uh, so, yeah, I hope it, uh, it continues like this, so, so these languages uh, grow in the data sets available. Yeah, I also hope the same here. Um, is Librosa still the most popular library to find audio characteristics, or there are other better libraries? And I guess if you can share <laughs> some of those. Yeah, Librosa, yeah, absolutely is quite popular. Uh, there is also Essentia, uh, which is quite well maintained, I think, by a big research group uh, very actively. Um, and also, I think, increasingly, you can find other libraries that are um, that, that include also uh, pre-trained layers, neural network layers, that perform audio transformations 
uh, as well. That might be more uh, more useful if you want to introduce them or insert them, let's say, into your model directly. But yeah, uh, the bros uh, essential are kind of dominating the field here. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want, after the talk, maybe you can write the the name of uh, the other, the second uh, library for the uh, people to. Uh, yes, I, I can write it in the chat. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, how do technologies like Shazam uh, decipher music and return singer and label name? Do they follow the same process? That is a question from Mohan. Uh, okay. So I don't think so. I think Shazam and other similar. Um, uh, products they they have an algorithm that works based on audio fingerprints so they take like the smallest amount of information from the audio of a song that can identify it and then they run a huge search process a huge search algorithm so they can give you the results so quickly so no it's it's a very different uh, technology okay um, then there is, uh, there are some people that are asking to share those 10 papers uh, you mentioned. Right. Uh, yeah. Again, I can put them, maybe I, I don't know if 10, but I can share them in the chat, the ones I, I know for sure. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, then uh, what new type of research are you looking forward to? or expect in this specific field. And thank you so much for the, the presentation. Thank you. Well, I, the, the field is, act, is actually a bit uh, forgotten. It's uh, still small, it's still very young. So I hope uh, all the effort that has been put into speech recognition applications and also uh, music information retrieval, um, because this field is a bit in the middle of both. Uh, so I hope uh, more effort is put into this intersection uh, so we'll be seeing maybe uh, fancy new models uh, in deep learning applied to, to this specific application. And also more data. Of course, we need more data, more public uh, data sets available as well. Great. Um, we have time for a couple of more questions. So uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. um, is neural networks the only way to solve this kind of problem? Or can other more simple machine learning techniques be used? Absolutely. So if you, if you see the beginning of this field, uh, you can see many other models, many other, many other technologies that have been used as the classifiers for single language identification. And you can see HMMs, you can see GMMs, or even simpler models. So what happened is that uh, during the explosion of machine learning, as in many other fields, we started seeing way better results when machine learning and specifically deep learning techniques were applied. But of course, you can uh, implement your models in a simpler way in the beginning if you want more uh, transparency or more explainability, and then later on, uh, go into the deep learning world. Makes sense. Good. Um, and then let's take maybe the final one um, for today. Um, well, there is one, what was the name of the mentioned source sep uh, separation library? Yeah, that's uh, called Splitter, but I will also write it in the chat if necessary. Okay, perfect. If you could do that, uh, that's great. For great. Sure. Then thank you again uh, so much, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks for this presentation. It was super, super interesting. So we're glad uh, to have you here. Uh, and then uh, let's welcome uh, Gustavo Pereira. Uh, who is going to talk about advanced cl clustering techniques for audience uh, segmentation. Hi, Gustavo. Hello, everyone. Just uh, thanks, Daniel, for the interesting presentation. Just want to mention that uh, Spotify just released a machine learning library uh, for segmentation and stuff like that. It's called Clio. So uh, you, might, you guys might want to check that. Uh, but enough about the previous presentation, uh, which was really, really fun. Um, so yeah, I'm Gustavo, I'm a, a senior data scientist at Spotify, and uh, lately I've been concentrated mostly on the segmentation of users. So uh, I will go into not so much into deep learning, uh, more sometimes more classical points of view, but uh, slightly different. 
And with that, I will need to share my screen. So, just one. All right, uh, let me know if you can see it because right now I'm watching at my screen. So the talk is, uh, has this uh, bombastic name, this recursive interpretable clustering, um, which, what is it, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll show you a picture right now. You will not be able to make heads or tails of it, but we'll come back to it later. Uh, so this is it. So this is what we're doing. We're doing segmentation this way. We get a lot of data. We process it somehow to get a low dimensional representation. We do this crazy stuff called recursive HD scan. Uh, and then we add a layer of interpretability and then we have some cluster assignments. It's a lot of words, but I will go uh, over all of this uh, one piece at a time. Uh, most important thing that I need to stress, this is about segmentation and segmentation does not have any true result. So it depends a lot on how you treat your data and what you have your data and for and what data you, you, uh, you, you did to your data, everything. So there's no ground truth. So everything needs to be taken with a human in the loop. That's, uh, and you need to be able to interpret so that what you do with those segments are, is meaningful. So number one is, uh, step is dimensionality reduction. And uh, if we have a panel of a lot of people who are studying AI, and uh, you know what dimensionality reduction is. So why dimensionality reduction? Because we need to be able to understand the data. We do it all the time. Every time you take a picture of something, you're doing dimensionality reduction. You're taking this four dimensional space we live in and you're freezing it in time. That's taking one uh, dimension off. And then you're even further splitting it into two dimensions and having this representation. So it's a form of dimensionality reduction. The most typical one, the one that you learn when you start data science is this, it's PCA. So PCA is barely understood. It's, and yes, uh, it's something that people do, uh, but there's, because it's very fast and because it's easy and when you have 10 variables, then it's okay. But the minute you get into production data, when you have hundreds or thousands of variables, then you get these blobs that you see here that are impossible to understand. And um, I keep joking that uh, cursed dimensionality that's in high dimensional space, no one can hear you scream because you are far away. Everything is far away. So everything ends up being in this big sphere and it's very difficult to interpret. By the way, um, for those uh, of you, this is the 10,000 first MNIST digits, so 100 digits, 784 dimensions. You run them through PCA, this is what you get. So this is not useful for us uh, because we have a lot of categorical data. We have a lot of things. So I will show you the same, exact same data, but this time through what we're using, which is a topological mapping called UMAP. It is exactly the same data, but now we have this beautiful islands very easy to see that this data has separated somehow. Um, it's fast, it's fairly fast. You can run a few hundred thousand points in a few seconds. Um, of course, the more points you have, the longer it takes and you, but now there's GPU uh, versions of UMAP that, so you can throw big problems at it. The problem is that it's very hard to interpret because it does very weird things to your data. So it it calculates forces of attraction. Uh, and so for points that are near, they will get closer, but for points that are not so near, they will push it away and it will do that in, yeah. I can go over the maths if you want to in uh, offline. Um, it does not suffer from the cursor dimensionality. Categorical data appears as many times as separate islands 
or it does the right thing and it was very useful for us we used it to interpret thousands of points in uh, surveys for instance what is the problem parameters there's parameters galore here and uh, it's very very hard to interpret this so how do we move and how do we avoid this problem of parameterizing is one of the main problems we have so we got our data we have islands so now that we have islands we can do the clustering step so what do we need from a clustering algorithm uh, i generally say that there's four things number one is you shouldn't be wrong uh, so if a cluster exists the point should be assigned to the cluster but if a cluster does not exist it should not be assigned to any cluster at all if it's noise it's noise then it should be intuitive the parameters should mean something um, especially when you don't know much about the data so you have a thousand variables and 20 parameters it's very hard to understand what you're doing and then you need to be stable so if you run it several times, you should get the same result. You, you change the order of the data, you should get the same result. Um, you sample a little bit, then you should get roughly the same thing again. Uh, and then you should be able to run it on big enough sets. And that is also always a problem with memory, but distributed computation uh, can solve that. So I'll show you the same picture again and uh, but now because we don't know what this is uh, this is the result that you get and this is what your algorithm is confronted to and again i'll go into the very classical data science interview and you have k-means and so for k-means you need to choose the number of clusters you want so i bet that anybody looking at this picture would say that there's at least six clusters probably eight so one two three there's a potential something breaking up here four five six and this looks to start to separate so you go into k-means and you put your clusters equal six of course you don't know that a priori you don't know how many clusters you need and that is a problem so you put k equals six and this is the result that you get look at this this is cluster one and this is cluster two and then this is cluster three and then this is cluster four and then you have clusters five and six this is wrong this is so wrong it's just unstable and it just happens that k means starts from random points so it decided to choose three points here and you will run it again and you will get a different result. And no, it does not work for us. And also you need to assume that there's six classes. We want to learn how many classes there are, not assume how many classes there are. And uh, it's a pet peeve of mine. K-means is not a clustering algorithm. K-means is a tiling algorithm. It creates tiles into your data. Um, so what do we need? We need something else. So we started going into more hierarchical type of things. So this is dbscan. So dbscan has this, is a different algorithm that is more tree-based. So it first creates a tree of your data with according to some distance. And because of that, you can create this dendrogram and then you select an epsilon somewhere here and let's say 0 0.3 and you cut the dendrogram at 0 0.3 and whatever is left is your clusters. Uh, two parameters here, uh, how many points you want and the epsilon that you want. And I will show you that this is not so intuitive. So if there's a, an improvement on HDB scan, which is on DB scan, which is HDB scan. So this is the same dendrogram, but it's just upside down. Uh, so the more points are here and then you start separating and it basically if, if I want to put in nice words it selects the branches that have the most ink 
Uh, so out of here, actually the more stable, but out of this representation, it's clear that oh, if this was a father and these were the kids, this is one of the kids with a lot of ink. And out of this other father, these two guys have more ink and this one has more ink than all of the things that come later. So these are the um, classes that you will choose. So I will show you in practice how, what this means. First, DB scan. So this is the same picture and it said, because I have 10,000 points, I want to see 500 points minimum and an epsilon of three. And what it does, it, it just gets these three clusters. So the next thing you do is go like, okay, so maybe I need a smaller epsilon and a smaller number of points. So smaller epsilon 0 0.5, smaller number of points 250. And so suddenly you have nine points and a lot of noise here and there. And again, it's very difficult to understand what's going on. And then you hit the right number and it was epsilon of two and 250 points. A lot of guessing. Why? Because this is not intuitive and it's, there's no one solution to this. You need to really understand what's going on with your data. Uh, so you go into HDB scan and you say, okay, I want to, there's only one parameter, which is the number of points that you want to see. So basically think about it this way. I have a certain amount of data and I will explore this data and anything below a percentage, say 5%, um, 500 points, uh, I will consider a cluster, everything bigger than this. So you go and get the six things. And th so you go like, but what if I chosen 250? And it's the same result. And what if I chose 100? And it's exactly the same result. So very stable, one parameter, very easy, very fast, and it does what you need. Okay, now you need to interpret this because what you did is um, you have created this monster where lots of variables and, and lots of algorithms. And then you have lots of variables that can be correlated like age or income. And, and you put them through a dimensionality reduction algorithm, which squashed points here and there. And so it's not easy to interpret. And then you have different variables that could be, have different distributions originally. And so going into typical study of centroids doesn't give you any information. However, however, what we did was we got the data, we did some mapping, we did some clustering, and we obtained this, clusters, labels. Let's call them A, B, C, D, E, or let's call them John and Peter, or whatever you want to call them. So now you have your original data, you have your clusters. So it's no longer a clustering problem. It's a classification problem. What happened here? So your unsupervised problem became a supervised problem and you have the wonderful XG boost that comes to the rescue and helps you do this. So now you have the original data, you can do all of this and now you have a classifier. So you can get any new point and get a correct label but now you need to present it to your stakeholders so what are you going to do oh this point this guy is uh, a music listener of type a because my dimensionality reduction my clustering algorithm and my classification algorithm says so no you cannot do that you need to be able to tell why you're doing stuff so you go into this, right? Variable importances. That's so what everybody does. Don't guys, don't do this. This is wrong. It's biased, it's inconsistent again. And so there's mathematical new tools that have come out in the field of interpretable AI. One of them is Shaq. It's amazing. It tells you the story of the model in five seconds. You can understand that this is a survival in the Titanic because I cannot use Spotify data, of course. And, and so surviving in the Titanic means that if you were female, you were likelier to survive. If you were in third class, you were likely not to survive. If you're a very young boy, you would survive. And if you had lots of siblings and spouses, you waited for them and you missed the boat. So you have a lot of information here. 
please read about Shaft. It's got all of these amazing plots that you can get, exactly why and how the model thinks about this. So this is classic service uh, of people on the Titanic. So people who were in second class, some of them had a good probability of surviving, some of them not so much. And if you look at why this split happens, it is because of gender. So females were slightly less likely to survive in second class and in first class. And the age uh, was, a, was a factor. Very young people survived. People around 30 were pushing people down the stairs and they survived and so on. Uh, so yes, we have a lot. And then there's a further trick, which is recursive testing. And I know I'm rushing through this, but I need to go fast. I don't have so much time. Uh, so we have HDB scan, right? And today I showed you that we saw six clusters, but there were probably more. And so we, might, we wanted to check if we could do some trick and recluster the clusters. And so I, I went into this and I saw this uh, cluster and said, what if I keep only this data? And I told you today that these were handwritten digits. I keep, so I keep only this data. And instead of, of looking at of doing the map and the dimensionality reduction for all the data, we do it only for this portion. And then we do HDB scan again. And then we look at the data. And here is what we get. We get three clusters, very nicely separated. And they correspond to these pictures, to the threes, the fives, and the eights. So this big cluster was a cluster of digits that have three horizontal lines and some curves, right or left. And then we learned to separate these curves to the left or to the right or to both sides. And then I went like, oh, what about this? This looks like a solid thing. And it's a cluster of zeros. So it's a zero is a zero. And you do the same and you get five different clusters with some noise and they are variations of zero, where there's rounded zeros and thinner zeros and slanted zeros and slanted and slightly rounder zeros, uh, which is uh, amazing. Uh, so imagine doing this, but for your audience and for your users. Uh, so you are not only able to get the bigger clusters where you see the big themes, but also you see the slightly smaller, nuanced version of the site. And so this is what we call recursive hierarchical clustering with dimensionality reduction. It's a mouthful. And this is the picture again. Right? And so you get your data. You do UMAP. And I showed you why, because UMAP worked, PCA didn't. So now you have your lower dimensional representation. And then you can do this recursive scan, uh, HDB scan. So you cluster the clusters. And on top of that, you can run models on each of these clusters. And on top of that, you can interpret them. So you can go to your stakeholders and say, this person belongs to this particular cluster because they have this particular characteristic. And that characteristic comes from your original data. Right? So there's a future. There's many problems with this because, yeah, you can run it several times. And so what we have been doing lately is uh, bootstrapping this. So taking one step further, uh, we, we run this 100 times and we can work with missing data. And so every time you get this, you get a slightly different subset, and, but in the end, you get the main things and you have a, a machinery where you don't need to train everything again. So yeah, there's an appendix here with lots of parameters, but this is the picture I want to show you uh, and keep here and uh, again, if you do all of this, you will get a lot of information about your users. Again, very, very, very important. Keep a human in the loop because when you get into this step, you will see the problems that your model has. We once ran into a problem that the main separator for one cluster was 
uh, people listening to Spotify every day on the plane. So basically people with a lot of money who had uh, free internet on the plane. So with that, I'll uh, leave it to questions. I know it went really, really fast, but it's pressed for time. Good. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gustavo. That was a really interesting and enjoyable talk. Uh, we did have a lot of questions and we have some time actually. Uh, so if you have more slides, <laughs> you know, that you rushed through, uh, feel free. But yeah. uh, um, maybe let's start with uh, one of the questions then. Um, how to determine which clusters consist of multiple other clusters? What metric is be being used there? Uh, and let me also so again, sure. yeah, that's okay. So the, the main thing is um, we have, um, because this is exploratory data analysis, so it's, it's your choice. So generally, we, we put a threshold. Uh, let's say you want to explore minimum. The, 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 the smallest you want to go is 5%. So let's say you put a threshold of 10%. If something is smaller than 10%, you don't want to divide it. Again, it's something that you choose to do. You can be as detailed as you want or as, as coarse as you want. Of course, uh, remember that you will need to show this to somebody. And uh, my analogy here is the, is the juggler. Right? Uh, with 10 minutes of training, you can learn to juggle three balls pretty easily. Uh, if you take one week, you will probably learn to do it with five. Uh, there's only one person in the world that was able to toss 15 balls at the same time. So imagine explaining to somebody your 15 cluster model. And remember that they need to keep all of that in the air all the time. So that's my analogy. Keep it simple. Interesting uh, analogy. Uh, I will take that also as in mind and as a lesson. <laughs> um, okay, another question here. Uh, oh, interesting one. What did you find most useful from your studies in your current day-to-day -day work? So the, the most interesting thing is that uh, sometimes what you do is, is you, you look at behavioral data uh, and you obtain some clusters that have got to do with behavior. Uh, and then you start to try to understand. And so you start adding pieces like demographics and stuff like that. And you start seeing that demographics are different uh, according to different behavioral things. Uh, or, or you discover a cluster and, and because at Spotify we, we have this amazing ability to have resources that go into the qualitative as well. So you can go to the field and ask people, hey, we believe you are this type of user. Do you identify yourself with this? And, and you discover further nuances or into this. So that's a very, very, very interesting uh, part of the work. OK, great. Um, so um, as you said, it's important not to invent uh, clusters from noise. Doesn't recursive clustering have a high risk of finding signal uh, in noise? Yes, it does. Uh, again, that's, that's why you, you set this threshold and that's why you put all of this interpretability layer on top. So you understand that you're not fitting noise. Uh, so it, it always needs this very uh, subtle understanding of your data that you really dig deep and uh, you cannot just go, uh, you cannot trust any machine learning model blindly because it could be biased, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, and ultimately you want this to be in a, in a product and uh, affect product decisions because of this or experiments. Uh, you, you run experiments and you look at these experiments through your clusters. Um, so yes, there is a danger. But again, you, there is a danger any time you do these sort of things. Okay, great. 
Um, are you familiar with intensive PCA as dimensionality reduction technique? What are your thoughts on it? Uh, honestly, no. Um, I, I've looked at several different types of, of uh, uh, I've looked at kernel PCA and uh, stuff like that. And uh, it, in no particularly intensive PCA will go away. Um, but in general, what I've seen is that these more topological approaches to, uh, to data have better results in production. Yeah. Um, then I, I see some uh, mentoring questions here. Guidance to master <laughs> students in AI who don't want to go into software engineering, entrepreneur, product management, and so on. Uh, I don't know the question. Do you have any tips for those? <laughs> it depends on, on, what, on what you enjoy, right? So. Do you want to be uh, more into the, the, you know, the racks and, uh, and do some machine learning uh, uh, engineering? Or do you want to be, to tell stories about your data? And they're not mutually exclusive. You will use machine learning into data science many times, right? Uh, so it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, it really depends on, on your choice. Uh, I, I am at this intersection of very technical data scientists. There are other data scientists that are more uh, business minded. It really depends on what type of person you are. Follow your heart, people. Um, what, if any, techniques were applied in your analysis to arrive at optimal HDB scan parameters like uh, epsilon, minimum points per cluster, and so on? So many of the times what we do is, is a grid search. Uh, for for HDB scan, you, you don't have an epsilon. That's a good thing. Uh, but most of the times we just try, we, we, we run a grid search and we look at stability of the clusters as a, as a measure because the HDB scan does measure this, uh, this idea of stability. Or, uh, the dendrogram that I was showing today, actually, if, if you look at the beginning and the end, uh, and you calculate an average there, uh, it's, it's kind of life and death thing. So the, the more stable, so the longer it is, the more stable it is. So, and, and once again, because it's exploratory data, you decide on the threshold of, I don't want to go lower than this. Okay. So that's the very interesting thing. Interesting. Um, and then a question about, uh, oh, okay, the first one. Have you attended any topological approaches like those proposed by Leland McInnes for clustering and unsupervised learning? I, 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 will, I will brag a little bit about this, but I exchanged some emails with Leland actually about some of the characteristics of the map. So he did not know about uh, the uh, recursive ability of, uh, of your map and uh, we've been discussing uh, some things with him. Uh, yeah, the, the top logic uh, and if you look at the Python uh, HTTP scan documentation was also written by Lina. Uh, so yeah, I did. <laughs> nice. Actually, your map was, is, is uh, the, paper, the original paper of your map is, is by Lina. And then there's been some uh, two, two more people that have contributed to that. Great, great uh, insight. Uh, let's have a couple of more questions then uh, before we end. Uh, how do you figure out uh, what the clusters uh, represent? So there's the interpretability layer that helps you understand what your data is doing according, what your model is doing according to your data. But then usually what you do is you augment your data with things that you haven't seen, that you didn't use in your model. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you're looking at only behavioral data, you can add uh, demographics. Uh, and so you can see that uh, this is most prevalent between uh, younger people, or this is uh, something that happens. These people uh, are mostly using uh, tablets 
uh, instead of this. So you see this behavior associated with a tablet because you know, whenever you have a, a, an app that runs on several surfaces, uh, then you have different implementations. And what happens is that people will use those things differently. And so basically sometimes you're learning what people are able to do with the different platforms. So that's, uh, it's how you figure out, again, you go, you look at your data, you add some data, you analyze, and then most of the times you give them a name. So, you know, music fan or artist fan, or artist follower or stuff like that. Yes, yes, makes sense. Um, and then let's um, ask a last question uh, for today. Um, how does UMAP compare to TSNE? So TSNE is, is the first algorithm that came with this topological idea. And it assumes that data has this uh, T distribution. Um, main problem with TSNE that I have is that it tends to create very circular data. So, so uh, it's not easy to cluster. Uh, and uh, there, there, there have been some papers actually where because of the way Tisney works, clustering is not really feasible uh, within Tisney. UMAP, you can use UMAP as Tisney. You can, uh, if, you, if you do the right parameters, so A equals one, B equals one, and some little other things that you need to do, you can get a T distributed, uh, kind of data. So in a way, UMAP is, is an improvement over Disney, I believe. And also UMAP has uh, this very, very interesting um, mathematical properties that ensure uh, locality as well as globality. So Disney uh, ensures locality. So you can, you know, in Disney, like if in the representation, uh, a point is close to another, uh, then they are locally close. Um, whereas uh, in, in UMAP, uh, points that are close are close in the feature space, but points that are far away in the UMAP representation are also far away in, in the original data or are more like, uh, it, they, are, uh, they are not deterministic algorithms. Uh, so yeah, it is, there is a high probability that you pushed it away. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, so for MNIST, the, the, the clusters would be okay, but they will all be in a round uh, circle somehow. With UMAP, you see the separation. So for us, it was uh, more amenable to analysis and easier to get results. And, with, and also it's a lot faster. UMAP is a lot faster to run than, uh, than Disney, but orders of magnitude faster. Okay, then uh, UMAP is sold then. <laughs> oh yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah, guys, use it. It's not easy, but go, go use it. Great, but uh, thank you so much, uh, Gustavo, for this uh, talk. That was really uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for sharing your work. Uh, it was uh, very good, um, I guess, for the community. It was interesting for me to, to follow this as a music fan, of course. Um, so uh, I hope that uh, you guys, all of you also enjoyed uh, this summit. Uh, that was the first online one uh, that we had. And we're actually planning to have more of this. Um, and given uh, this situation now, we're gonna use the online setup in some way or another. So we're still experimenting with uh, this platform and how to do it. So it would be great before you go, if you could give us your feedback um, in Slido. Uh, we have a short poll, doesn't, won't gonna take you more than two minutes of um, what went wrong, what went well, what you want to hear about in the future um, and just like uh, write us your feedback. So uh, hopefully see you next time. And again, guys, thank you so much for sharing your work. Good night.